I'm Narelle Todd. And I'm Essie Susan Smith. We are the self-publishing author and marketing duo that has sold over 2 million books. But we didn't start out knowing how to sell books. Fast forward past many failed promotions and a lot of lessons learned, you will see how we went from self-publishing newbies to hitting the New York Times bestsellers list and making the USA Today bestsellers list 19 times and counting. We created the Get My Book Out There podcast to give you simple yet effective marketing strategies to increase readership and book sales so you know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, as well as some tips for staying mentally and physically well. Let's get started. This week, we have a very special guest this week that I'm excited to introduce, Robin Peterman. Robin, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am an author. I write uh, paranormal romance. I am considered hybrid because I'm uh, traditionally published and independently published. My career started on a big fat hairy lie. I was at a convention. They no longer have it, Romantic Times. Do you remember that one, Susan? Um, I never attended one, but I do remember it. And they had a thing called Pitchapalooza. It was a big room and it had agents and publishers and you had like three minutes per table and a buzzer went off and you could pitch. And they were looking for contemporary romance, which I didn't write, but I was an actor most of my grown up life. I was a professional actor for my whole grown up life. And after I had kids, I eased back on that. So I decided to pitch. I called my husband first and I'm like, I think I'm just going to go sit there and lie. And he goes, do it. So I pulled a contemporary romance out of my rear end and made people laugh. And I had 11 between agents and and publishing houses ask for a full manuscript. So I lied some more and uh, said, I have to go home and get it professionally edited, which meant write it. And I wrote a 95K word book in three weeks. I got the shingles uh, from that. And I also got a three book deal with Kensington. So that's how I started my career. But I always, and I was first published in 2013. So I was in my late forties with my first published book, but I always wrote, even when I was an actor, I used to do something called punch up script, which means I wrote jokes for TV shows and movies and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's how my career started. I went completely indie after that. For me, being traditionally published was great. The experience was was wonderful. Nothing bad to say about the artistic experience. The people I worked with, the money was terrible, but it wasn't a bad way for me to start because I learned a tremendous amount. I still have those relationships. I don't believe in burning bridges and they were great people, but financially speaking, it would be hard to be a full-time author. And I think a lot of authors nowadays are discovering that because I'm seeing more and more traditional authors leaving and becoming indie authors. The girls I had around me, like Donna McDonald and Jennifer Madden, they were part of my writing group. So I was working with women who were easing into indie as I was traditional. I thought all women writers were as fabulous as this group of women. There are a lot of fabulous women writers and there are some that are not so much. There's a lot involved in being an indie author because you're your own business. That's exactly what I was explaining last night to a group of young authors who are interested in following this career. I'm trying to explain to them that there's a difference now with the traditional that they're not doing as much as the promotion and marketing that they used to that's falling on the authors to do but if you go indie you're going to have a better chance of making more money but you're going to have to also be willing to do the work that goes behind it it's not all glamour sitting down and just writing a book oh, and- no, it's it's very it's a lot of work you have to be dedicated focused and creative to do this and organized is right. is I, I find nora she's got all of those qualities and loosely tries to round me back up <laughs> it's like herding cats real, <laughs> yeah squirrels. Cats, herding squirrels. better i mean the best part of all of it is writing stories but you you would be foolish right now to think that that is the only thing you have to do you have to even do the parts that you don't think are tremendously fun however quite honestly all of it can look at it like a game or a puzzle. And if you just do that, you're fine. I mean, I write comedy. So my voice on social media, for example, is very close to what I write. It's silly. It's engaging. It's slightly profane, whatever. So that either is, I lucked out because that same voice is very similar to what I write. It's all advertising to a certain degree, all of social media. You can actually be more of yourself. Yeah. You know, without having to pretend like you're someone else, which that I think can be very, very draining. The marketing part, like how much of your day do you think you spend or your week? Does marketing and promoting and all of that take? Okay. I think that there's a truly a fine line 
between art and commerce. And, and if you walk it, it's easy to fall off of it. You have to have something good to sell or else all the marketing in the world is not going to take you anywhere. So I would say, Susan, every freaking day is different for me. If I'm on a deadline, I'm writing nonstop and maybe the marketing falls to the side a little bit. I have who I call magic Wanda. I'm like, you have Norell. And so that I'm very fortunate for that. Half marketing, half writing, probably. I don't set up a day. No day. Is, I still have kids at home. I mean, my daughter's a senior in high school right now. My husband travels extensively. So I get pulled in a lot of directions. I'm really unfortunately creative late at night. So I tend to write overnight, which isn't always the healthiest way. Like you had asked, we had talked about a question about balance. Yeah, That's something I'm working on very hard. I don't have a lot of it. My husband's an actor. He's a film and television actor. And last year during the pandemic, there was zero work going on. So he started again. He's done two movies this year, but I was the man. I, not the man. I don't even, that sounded sexist. I was the breadwinner last year. So I worked like a crazy woman and lost my balance altogether. So that's been a goal now. And I think a lot of writers have this problem is balance. That's something that Narelle and I talk about all the time because she been trying to help me find that, that level of balance. Because like you said, it's so easy to get so focused and lose the direction that you're going because there's so much going on and it's a little bit more difficult when you're working from home it's so easy to just kind of keep it up keep it up and now yeah. i know you still have this issue being yeah. at home but i think you're a little bit better at it than we are at saying no time out i'm gonna do this <laughs> well you know the other thing too is that here's where you can't get lost in the art and commerce thing writing book is an artistic creative endeavor so when i get i call them it amused. I mean, people can call it whatever they want. I say he has a ponytail and a black turtleneck. And when he shows up, I write and I'm a pantser, which means I don't plot. So puzzle mm -hmm. pieces click, it's better than an orgasm. Let's say equal. Because that kind of artistic excitement, like I was an actor, you know, my whole life before I wrote. And so some kind of, I don't feel like acting and writing is all that much different because it's still I write very dialogue heavy. It's still being consumed with character. It's storytelling. It's just in a, I can wear, I don't have to get Botox. I don't have to worry about my wrinkles and I can wear sweatpants and sit on my back porch and wear no makeup. Although I put on makeup for you today. Um, I don't even remember what the question was. I mean, that's where the, the balance between art and commerce. So that's why I say sometimes I lose perspective of how to keep balance because I'm like grabbed me and then I go with it because sometimes it's not grabbing you. God dang it. This is hard. My husband's going to go for a run. Do you want to say hi? Yeah. <laughs> say hi. Hello. Susan and Norell. Hello. That's Hello. Norell. There's Susan. Hi. How are you? Okay. Hi, yes. Steve. How are you going? Good. He's going to go on a run. Excellent. All right. Bye. See ya. <laughs> What I've found is when I'm in the creative, it's all fitting and the creative juices and stuff are flowing. I just go with it now because I know on the days or the, the times where it's not working, I'll actually take time then because there's no sense trying to force something. Yeah. And uh, which often I used to do before was like, well, I haven't, you know, this is work hours and so I have to work. And then it's like, well, no, it doesn't actually work that way. I might get inspired. I might wake up at 5 a.m. and say, oh, I've got to write this content exactly. or whatever it is, or it could be at night. Yeah. Part of what I've done is I, not so much gone, I need balance. I'm going yeah. to work it from nine to five. It doesn't, I don't find it works like that. No, I, I do bet. find I work seven days a week, but yeah. I'm trying to work a little less. And, and you know, the other thing is, is if I find myself, like I used to say, you need to get this amount on paper every day, yes, you know, yes. a work in progress. But then I end up with a lot of stuff I have to toss sometimes. And which isn't a bad thing too, because anything I toss, one, I never delete it. It goes into a folder that I call the, I don't know if we can say bad words. So I'll say the poop folder. So there's nothing wasted ever, but since I pants, I can waste a lot if I force, force, force. If I find yes. myself going, you know, I'm writing, but I'm like, I'm gonna go change that laundry. Or, oh, there's some dishes in the sink. I know that I'm not on a good roll. And I think, okay, I'll spend an hour marketing, go for a walk, and then I'll try yes. again. I'm trying yes. to learn to be better at that. Yeah. But I definitely take one day completely off with nothing. Do you? Okay. Yeah. I need to emulate that. I I'm find that's been really good. And of course, last year, the pandemic helped in a strange way with that because it was like, you just couldn't keep it up. It also forced me to get back out into the garden and yeah. Yeah. do a lot of those things. Whereas before I might say, go watch a movie, but 
when movies I, and TV weren't being made, I know. it was, you know, not much you know, to watch. It was actually kind of great. I made so much gazpacho and I made uh -huh. a bruschetta. And I mean, so I always try to find some kind of silver lining, even in yes. gray, gray clouds. And I had my kids here with me, my son, who should have been at college, he had to come home. So I had my, and I really like my kids. So I had more time with my son than I never thought I would necessarily have again. Yeah. And I wrote some good books that I'm really proud of during that time. But then again, like I said, this year, one goal, and I just had this talk with Steve last night. I was like, I got I need balance. I need somebody to make me get up out of my yes. chair. So when you moved from traditional to indie, was it more about the money or was there something else that you went, I'm going to go do that? What was that decision? Like? Had, had to do with a couple of things. I had written a vampire series, which it's called the Hot Damn series. And I'm now getting ready to go into writing book 16 in that series. And as far as traditional was concerned, vampires were out. They didn't sell, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, hindsight? Thank God they said that because that's why I went India. I was like, screw you. I think this is great. And it's what I wanted to write. So that's one. And then the women around me were encouraging and we all learned together. And so that's really why. And it was the smartest thing I ever did. And I thank God every day that New York didn't want vampires at that point, because that series, it still does really, really well. So that's kind of how I fell in. It was the girls, the wonderful women around me. And the fact that New York can be a dinosaur about a lot of things and a little bit off, but there's a very large still audience for paranormal romance for vampires, for werewolves. I'm doing something now called Paranormal Women's Fiction, which is kind of a mashup of women's fiction and paranormal. That's kicking butt. This is a great job for me because I bore easily. Being an actress was a great job for me because I bore easily. It's always changing. You know, I jump from series to series or I start something new. It, it helps keep me whole. Do you think that another issue that the traditional New York has is they don't know where to put a lot of new types of stories that are coming out nowadays. You know, it's like, what shelf am I supposed to put this on? I remember somebody telling me once, well, how am I supposed to market this? And I'm like, if you're in marketing and you don't know how to market it, then you need to find another job. Well, here's what I think. Not unlike the fashion industry, which decides what's going to be in style over a year ahead of when it's going to come out. Yeah. I think that what I've noticed in the past is that traditional publishing seems to tell you what's going to be popular in the future, not always necessarily true. So I was surprised I ever even got a contract with New York because I'm very out of the box as far as a writer goes. I'm hard to peg. I would say, I mean, some people call my traditional books, which are supposedly contemporary romance, they call them chick lit because it's really friendship heavy, but there's romance and it's sexy and you know, all that fun stuff. But labeling can get you into trouble and labeling can stunt people. And I think possibly that's part of the problem, possibly with traditional. For a while, the next big thing was historical romance was making a big comeback. Well, historical romance never went out for people who love historical romance. Yes. But then they were, everybody was looking. So then now in the past year, year and a half, it's been women's fiction. But the definition of women's fiction is very different than what we understood it to be at first. Women's fiction should be very uh, friendship heavy, women driven. But now a lot of women's fiction that's being labeled as women's fiction has sex, has romance, not just romantic elements, just real romance. So everything muddies itself and it's about money. Yeah. Yes. Well, when yeah. I look at um, categories that traditional books are putting themselves into, just say, yeah, on Amazon, you can see yeah. that they're going for where they think they're going to find a new audience or an audience which is <laughs> way different to what the book actually is about. Yeah, it's not bad business unless you're lying. And lying is never good. I don't think people who put wrong genres up for their books, you're not serving yourself. Yeah, maybe you'll make a random list for, you know, Joe Schmo at the grocery list. Those things don't really matter in sales if there's not an audience for that genre. Yeah. yeah. So if you were giving advice to a newbie author, say somebody who's stepping into self-publishing for the first huh? time, what would be the one or two things you would say for marketing? You know, these are the things that you need to do. Forget everything else, do this. Is that even possible? Quite honestly, before you can even say marketing, they have to have a good book, great editing, good cover, good yes, blurb, yes. just bottom line. After that, I would say pick the social media that you feel most comfortable on and have the most fun on. For me, the easiest one is Facebook. I belong to some of the other ones. There's not enough hours in the day to keep track of all of that. So pick one. Website would be key. But I tell you what, there's something about cross-promotional marketing, which costs you zero money, mm -hmm. which is a very, very powerful thing. So it's like, whether it's 
joining Facebook groups with other authors in your genres with, you know, I can answer you in like 50 different ways, but I would say pick one form of social media where you're the happiest, where you think you can do it. And then the other stuff has to be there. The stuff I said first. And then I would say, you know, it's about studying, studying other authors that you fit into their category. Look at how they're categorizing themselves. Look at covers, other covers in your genre. And you never want to copy anybody, but if you see a trend or a theme that speaks to you, you know, you don't want to have man boob on a paranormal comedic romance. You're going to, mm -hmm. cartoon cover is what's going to sell that. I don't care how much you like man boob and man boob can be very pretty, but, and you're not going to do a cartoon cover for sci-fi, for example, necessarily, unless you're going on more humorous vein. So I would say educating yourself just by Googling crap and go to Amazon, go to, you know, Barnes and Noble, wherever it is. And that's what you got. You have to have a good idea of who you are. I'd also kind of suggest kind of know who you are as a writer, because if you write in eight different different genres. It's really hard for your audience to understand who you are as an author. I think when you establish yourself, like if you write comedic paranormal romance, like I did, and I feel YA is one of my passions. I love reading YA. I love YA. So I am, once I'm established enough in what I do, and I have another, I have a pen name for YA because I wouldn't want children necessarily reading sexier books. And I would yeah. use Robin Peterman writing as to do my YA, but I'm established enough and I can draw audience and they would understand. There's a, a similar voice there. So, but that's one of the good things and bad things about indie is I could write sci-fi today, contemporary romance next, and then I could write urban fantasy book right after that. But I would muddy the water of who I am as an author. Susan, what do you think about that? Well, I'm like you, I get bored very easily. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've got some YA, I've got some different stories that are out there, but I try to promote myself as the worlds of S.E. Smith. So I'm branding myself as the writer of all of these different genres doesn't really matter which book you're reading whether it's my contemporary suspense thriller or my sci-fi or my paranormal they all have the same tone where they're they follow with the friendships they mm -hmm. follow with the romance they follow with the action and adventure mm -hmm. and the thread of humor throughout the story yeah. So it doesn't matter what you're reading, you're going to get those elements because that's my voice. And it just happens to be the setting that the characters and the world that the characters are in. I found that I didn't have a hard time because a lot of people said, oh, contemporary readers won't follow you to your paranormal. But I write comedically and that's the thread through everything that I write. And they've followed me. They have followed me, which has been great. Been and great. I think, you know, not all authors can pull that off, but it's if that's your voice and your voice carries over, whether you're writing YA or you're writing a sci-fi or you're writing women's literature. I mean, you can have a women's literature that's got a lot of, about friendship, a lot about action adventure, and a yeah. lot about humor. I do. I write what I want to read. I hope people like it. I don't write for my reader. I don't know how people would. I write what's inside yes. my head because if I didn't, mm -hmm. I would need therapy. Therapy's great, but the writing has been amazing for me. There's so much happening up here that I I can't stop or control. And so I write what I have to write. Then I hope so far so good, you know, that people enjoy it. But yeah, I write the stories I need to tell. And like you said, I write the stories that I want to read mm -hmm. and I have very eclectic taste. You know, I like reading I different things, mm -hmm. but I don't write dark, don't write depressing stuff because of the fact that I think the world's dark enough. I like being able to escape into a place where yes, there may be some really tense moments or really sad moments. But you always know that at the end, there's going to be happily for now or happily ever after. Well, I also don't think comedy is funny without the juxtaposition of pathos or yeah. violence forever battles because yeah. joke, 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 joke is not funny. Exactly. And you know what? Things that are, are have a dark tone to them, two way down, if there's not some lightness interjected. Look, the juxtaposition of anything, whether it be in a story and writing and acting, it's far more interesting. It's much more interesting to watch someone try not to cry than to snot cry. Yes. There's something holding, working against what it is. And I find that I, thank God it happens kind of naturally. Maybe it just comes from acting training, but that's what happens to me naturally when I write. And I love it. And when it hits right, it's that, oh, it's so good. I love that feeling.
Love it. So quick question. How much of your life experience goes into your writing? Dude, a lot. The book I just wrote, the most recent one to come out is called The Right Hook. And it's about a romance writer whose characters come to life, which that thought has fascinated me for years. And I'd been wanting to write it for a long time. Mm -hmm. She is probably the most like me, although I have never caught my husband banging the weather girl on the kitchen table when I walked in with the film crew following me. For my latest, you know, but she is a lot of her habits, a lot of my habits, even in my male characters. You can't, I don't tell my biggest secrets ever, but I work out my feelings about, I have very ambivalent feelings a lot about religion and stuff like that. A lot of this gets worked out in my books. I'm a very person who you can love whoever you want to love. This comes out in my books. A lot of research goes into my books. Not everybody would know that because sometimes they're just over the top, silly, funny. But um, there is, there's a lot of me, but nothing that I probably wouldn't tell people. Although one of my books in my Magic and Mayhem series, my brother passed away six years ago. Yeah. For a while, nothing made sense to me, right? Nothing was funny. I worked through that in a book about whether or not my heroine mm -hmm. would let someone who had died move on to what it's called the next adventure in this particular series while people who read it might be moved a little bit or find it sweet or whatever for me it was so much more than that and that's not anything I haven't said like in a book talk about that book and stuff like that yes the answer ultimately in that big roundabout answer was yes there are parts of me in my books but nothing that I am not willing to give away privacy is important to me especially with what Steve does yes and I agree, you know, yeah. the same thing. I think those life experiences that we do put in, things that we've gone through, makes us better authors because we're able to capture those emotions, and those feelings for the readers that they've experienced it as well. And I yeah. just think that that's a unique yeah. quality. Yeah, I forget. Like I get letters sometimes from people that make me sit down and make me a little breathless. Like what? Yeah. I have no idea that my silly, fantastical stories would move someone like that or help somebody in a situation where they're not well, or it's very humbling. Am I writing the great American novel? No, but I'm writing from my heart things I'm very proud of and that I love. Yes. And um, so that kind of stuff is like icing on a cake that I didn't know I made. And those things are very humbling. You've spoken a lot about connecting with other authors. So, you know, your writer's group and, you know, what how they were brilliant, cross-promotional, that sort of stuff. You have a world. So it used to be in a Kindle world, but mm. now you've created, let's call it a world. Magic and Mayhem universe. Universe, sorry. How important is that to you as part of that um, connection with other authors? Is it a purely business decision? That's part of giving back to to the craft is it you know what's, it's a what's multitude. behind that? when kindle worlds ended i really enjoyed doing that and i did it by invite with friends who were interested in doing it kind of like fan fiction to a certain degree by really good writers who want to play in my sandbox so when the program ended i decided yes. i was going to continue it but i waited until draft to digital came up with a way to do it where i didn't have to do payroll taxes royalty divide any of that stuff i changed the terms so they were much more favorable to the authors which they weren't that way with kindle mm -hmm. worlds necessarily and um, what it has been a delight it's a lot of hard work because I pay a lot of attention to it, but it's been one of the most positive cross-promotional experiences that I've had. And yes, do I make money? Yes. Am I getting rich off of it? No. But I also think in this landscape of being a writer, so basically I have a publishing company on the side with my partner being draft to digital that I have a secondary income that also, because it's based on my Magic and Mayhem series, it mm -hmm. continues sell that series, which I continue to write in. So it is a smart business move that is a heart project for me. And there are writers that I would say sell incredibly well in there. I don't invite anybody that I don't think is a good writer. However, I will say there are some really good writers that haven't found their audience yet. So this yeah. might be better for them than it is for me, but that's also a great thing. And if I can do that for somebody, then yay on me. And so it's been a good thing. And I have waiting lists all the way through 2023, which is, I can't believe that, you know, and we yes. take really good care of our people. We work very hard on selling backlist, but yeah, it's a business decision that comes from my heart. 
that's what that is. And it's been good. Very good. That's brilliant. And I love the part about diversification. I think as an author, oh. that's so important. Your book is not just a book. Or I like to say it as, um, say, putting pillars underneath your business. So if that's you've true. only got the one pillar of a book, if that's all that's holding your business up, something happens with that and you've got no other things to hold up, your business will crumble. And to diversify, truly diversify, you have to be, just burped for you guys, you have to be a little bit of Thank stuff. You or have a little bit of a body of work, you're welcome. I do find it interesting. I'll have some people who are, are new write to me and I try to write back to people, in, especially if they're polite. If they're not, I don't. But if somebody's nice and asks a question that's not easily found or just their letter is engaging, some people think if you write one book, that's all you got to do. That's another piece of information, I guess, I would, if we went back that question, I would say, you can't have a career on one book. Yes. You know? In the film business, you're as good as your last film did. And to a certain degree, because there are a lot of people that are authors now, and some are fabulous, and some could probably use some good lessons and some editing and some etiquette, but you have to continue to write. That's the only way to have a career doing this. Yes. So, so what Susan, else do you have a on? final question? I'm just so listening to her thinking, separate. oh, now I know why we get along so well. <laughs> Last question. One of the hardest things, and I know you said that you were the primary breadwinner last year because of the pandemic. I know my home life structure had changed a lot with Steve, my Steve. It's funny because we're both married to Steve's, but my yeah. Steve was around more. He wasn't going off and doing all of the things that he normally does. So there was a lot more distractions having everybody at the house. How was it trying to juggle running the business and, and actually needing to do a little bit more with having more distractions at home. I will say that they called my Steve man mom last year. He <laughs> was awesome. I'm a great cook. I love cooking. I love feeding people. He cooked. He's good too. He really <laughs> took over all that stuff. And we have a gazebo. We have a farm. So I would go out to the gazebo. It has a fan and electricity and you know all that good stuff. Because your kids will just go, hey mom. And I'm like, and if interruption is worst thing that can happen to an author when yes. you're writing the book, marketing, whatever, you can be interrupted while you're marketing. But if you're in a story, interruption is like, I can't think of anything worse. Yes. So I used it can to be go hide the death of it. Yeah. Even sound in my house would bother me. Like, I'm like, what the hell is that? And it's some kind of music for my daughter singing, which I love to hear her sing, but I'm like, oh my God. So I would go to the gazebo a lot, or I would say, mm -hmm. guys, today, unless you're on fire, don't even even look at me or come anywhere near me. And they were awesome. They were awesome. So <laughs> a challenge, I was possibly rude at some, you know, certain points in time, but we made it work. We're all artists in this family. My son's a playwright in school for playwriting. My daughter's going into musical theater. Steve's an actor. I'm a writer now, was an actor. So everybody gets the crazy that goes with art in this family. Yes. Nobody thinks it's weird. Yeah. Well, you're more fortunate because it was a little more difficult here. <laughs> but you got it done, didn't you? I'm ready for things to get a little bit back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's yeah, it is. We all just need to get our vaccines and keep I'm done for a little while. I'm Me done. Too. We're done. <laughs> yep. And I got my both. I'm totally vaccinated. My parents got vaccinated, which was hugely important to me. We can go back there eventually. I think it might look like a slightly new normal. I don't know, but yes. I'm ready to get back to whatever the uh, new normal is going to be might look like. Yeah. We're having this Sentinel because she hasn't had the opportunity to get vaccinated yet. <laughs> you guys are doing better We're in Australia though when, than we did. Yeah. We closed down. New We're Zealand, not. you guys, that was yeah. really impressive. And so yeah. My fingers are crossed that you get your vaccination soon. I want everybody, everybody that I yeah. care about, everybody I know, everybody I don't know. I just, I want everybody to be safe. Yeah. Rarely even now have community transmission. Like I, the first time I ever wore a mask was two weeks ago and that was for two oh, weeks. Wow. And I was like, okay, I get it now what everybody's been complaining about for the past, you know, yeah. year. Well, yeah. Susan, I'm not writing about the pandemic in my books, are you? No, no, I'm not writing yeah. about that, but I may write yeah. about some of the more funny situations that have come where oh, somebody yeah. may find themselves in it and it's like oh that's just too good not to miss putting out absolutely. a book <laughs> yeah absolutely but I have not some people have to me reading this year for me too has been to get away from it yeah. I don't want to read about it. I want to get taken away from it so I've made I've made a choice not to do that and I think that's in good for authors to be aware that they can choose how to 
deal with yeah. current life in their books as well because I think some have been saying oh I need I to talk about it well no and for many don't people you, we don't want to use our escape I, I read to escape I don't want to escape into, into what I'm escaping yeah. from I think I think with like Susan and myself per se because we're writing in more for the most part in more magical worlds world build i think somebody who's writing contemporary fiction stuff like that might have that struggle more than i would or maybe necessarily susan would which is know. strange because our worlds are perfect to have a pandemic or something run through them and it's like <laughs> oh no yeah. and that's mm -hmm. one of the things that i've noticed that during this pandemic i don't want to watch deeply serious movies or you know anything laugh. that's going to be i want to laugh i want to go out on an adventure I'm really into, you know, the sci-fi, as long as it's not mixing too much of the horror in it. Of course, you know, I'll be sitting there going, look at this plot hole and what are they thinking? Or they obviously weren't thinking when they wrote that, but it's still fun because it's that, yeah. it's that escape from everything that's going on. So. My guilty pleasure, and I didn't watch it originally, was I binged Schitt's Creek, which was... Uh -huh so much fun and gave me so much joy i mean that was great it was great so that was fun so yeah so i don't watch a lot of tv shockingly enough i tend to watch documentaries and stuff like that but i did my daughter was like mom you gotta watch this and i was like and then i did and i got i watched what is it six C's? i watched all of it and it was great oh you know what else is really funny <laughs> and vampires what we do in the shadows we did you have a Rob question no, no i was just gonna uh, thank robin for coming and <laughs> onto the podcast today it has been fabulous you guys are welcome Narelle. i'm glad we finally like got to talk and susan it's lovely to see you and then i hopefully sooner rather than later in person again so you guys thank yes. you for having me yeah <laughs> oh it's been a blast and a pleasure you're just as fun as your books so <laughs> so everybody make sure that you check out robin peterman can you give mm -hmm. us your website address robinpeterman.com so make sure that you check out robinpeterman.com if you need a great escape and lots of laughs <laughs> thank you thanks everyone and we will call it um a day thank you bye hey thanks for joining us today you know we've got way more information we want to share with you to increase your book sales so please come and join me at facebook.com get my book out there